Hi, Mr. Juros here, and today I'm going to talk to you guys about water. So this slide shows water existing in three phases of matter. We see water existing as a solid, also as a liquid, and as a gas. And it's one of the few substances here on Earth that exists in those three phases of matter quite frequently. So water is one of those molecules that many people often take it for granted. And when we think about water, we also associate water with life. So water and life go hand in hand. And water makes up about 70 to 75 percent of your body weight. And it's a very important molecule that we need to address in order for us to delve a little bit further into biology. And one of the biggest properties of water is that it's what's called um, polar. So it has polarity. And I want to discuss in this video what polarity really means. In order for us um, to address that, we have to first look at the molecular structure of water. So I hope that you're thinking about that molecular structure of water, and perhaps you already know that water is made up of hydrogen and oxygen. So these are two, uh, this is a cartoon that shows hydrogen, and this is a cartoon that shows oxygen. And the balls that you see orbiting around this um, the nucleus of the hydrogen and the nucleus of the oxygen, those represent electrons. So why is this important? Well, let's take a look at the periodic table of elements. So the periodic table of elements is a great way that scientists um, can categorize the elements that are found here on Earth. Looking at oxygen, we see oxygen found in group 6 all the way to the right of the periodic table, while hydrogen is found in uh, group 1 period one, so period stands for the rows and the group stands for the columns. So, okay, so we have oxygen, we know where they exist on the periodic table of elements, but why do these groups matter? Well, the groups tell us how many electrons are found in the outermost shell of each of those elements. So let's look at that outermost shell. Let's go back to hydrogen. Now, I'd like you to count how many electrons are in the outermost shell of hydrogen, and I think this is pretty easy. So you should be thinking E, E for electron, is equal to 1, okay? And then I asked you how many electrons are found in the outermost shell of oxygen. You should be thinking E, and just counting those electrons, is equal to 6. All right, so just for the sake of this video and for what we need to know for bonding purposes, I kind of blocked out the electrons, the innermost electrons in the inner shell. Don't worry about that. I really want to focus on the outermost shell. So just looking at the outermost shell, you should be counting six electrons total. So if I were to tell you that in order for hydrogen to be stable, it actually needs two electrons. And in order for oxygen to be stable, it actually needs eight electrons. Then you could do the math and then you can figure out, well, how many electrons does hydrogen need in order for it to be stable? You should be thinking one. And then how many more electrons does oxygen need for it to be stable? And you should be thinking two. So it needs one for hydrogen and two for um, oxygen. All right. So if you, this kind of is like a puzzle and if you were to um, say or how many elements would I need of hydrogen and how many elements would I need of oxygen for them both to be stable. Well, doing the math, it's quite simple. You only need two hydrogens and you need one oxygen. Okay, so oxygen here, what will happen is oxygen will end up forming a bond with this hydrogen molecule and in doing so it will it will um, form a bond here, and hydrogen will also form a bond with oxygen here because these electrons will then be shared. And so it looks something like this, so the molecules will look like this, where if now if you were to count these electrons, you'll find that hydrogen will have two electrons and it's a stable molecule, so that's good. And then this hydrogen will also have two, it's stable. And then counting all of the electrons that are now found on oxygen, it's not six anymore, it's eight. And it's eight because it's sharing the electrons from the hydrogen molecule that is now bound to it. So this kind of bond that forms between hydrogen and oxygen is what's called a covalent bond. So there's a covalent bond, and a covalent bond means that there's sharing of electrons. So when elements share electrons, that's called a covalent bond. 
So let's um, now take a look at the idea of water being a polar molecule. So I mentioned to you before that um, for every um, oxygen there are two hydrogens and that oxygen um, I didn't say this before, but now I'm going to tell you, oxygen is what's called um, electronegative. So electronegativity is a property that some elements have, and basically what that means is that when an element is electronegative, it likes to pull electrons close to itself. So it attracts electrons more or uh, highly, um, or more frequently than other elements do. And oxygen ranks number two um, and all of the elements that are found here on Earth as being the um, second most electronegative element on Earth. Second to fluorine, actually. Fluorine is number one. All right, so if I showed you this picture again, so we have oxygen and then we have these two hydrogen molecules that are bound to the oxygen, and zoomed in on this particular part right here. So if we zoomed on this bond right here, so this is kind of zooming in, on that bond right here, where we see this bond that forms based on the electrons that are being shared. So these, this electron and this electron, one originally belonging to hydrogen and this electron originally belonging to oxygen, are now being shared. Okay, so a covalent bond means that electrons are being shared, but now if I said that this is a polar covalent bond, what would that mean? Well, because oxygen is so electronegative, what will happen is that it pulls the electrons closer to itself. So these electrons will end up getting pulled a little closer to oxygen than to hydrogen. This plays a really big role on, um, on whether or not this molecule is polar. And because oxygen pulls those electrons a little bit closer to itself, what we begin to see is the oxygen bearing a slightly more negative charge. And what do you think hydrogen would bear? A slightly more positive charge as a result. And so this unequal distribution of the electrons across a molecule is what makes water polar. So that definition of a molecule being polar means, so that the definition of a water mo molecule being polar is simply put as a molecule having an unequal distribution of charge across it. So in this case, we don't see a neutral charge across this molecule. It's not... Um, it's not the electrons aren't in the middle; they're actually pulled closer to the elect to the oxygen, so that this part has a slightly more negative charge, and this part has a slightly more positive charge. All right. So, um, looking at so now, let's look at the space um, filling model of oxygen, which is this model right here. So when you have like those balls as a, a space filling model, where oxygen is represented in red and hydrogen is represented in white. If I asked you to draw the um, charges across these molecules, you should be able to draw the delta negative here and the delta positives by the hydrogen. So this symbol, delta negative and delta positive, you'll see that quite often in your chemistry textbook and also in biology. And this means that it's a partial negative charge. It's not a full negative or it's not a full positive. It's just a partial. There's just a slight um, negative charge on the oxygen end and there's just a slight positive charge on the hydrogen end. So that's what that delta symbol stands for. Delta negative and the delta positive here. This is often used to um, compare this as a comparison to a magnet. So if you look at a magnet where you have a north and a south end where you have like a positive versus a negative end, that's very similar to how a water molecule is. So a water molecule itself acts just like a magnet where you have a positive end here and then a negative end here. So these molecules, one molecule by itself of water uh, can act as a magnet, but when you have many molecules um, interacting with each other, we begin to see these charges uh, forming, um, being really important, forming as a force to holding these molecules together. So what holds these molecules together? Well, if you think about oxygen having a slightly more negative charge and hydrogen having a slightly more positive charge and opposites attract, so we know that positive attracts to the negative, we see these bonds forming between the oxygen and the hydrogen molecule. So an oxygen of one 
molecule and a hydrogen of another molecule. This is called a hydrogen bond. So these hydrogen bonds are, in, are an incredible force because they hold these molecules of water together. And so hydrogen bonds play a really big role in um, how water functions in sustaining um, life. So one hydrogen bond by itself, just to note, is relatively weak. And many hydrogen molecules together are very strong forces. So one hydrogen molecule by itself can break pretty frequently. And actually, that's exactly what happens. So when you think about a... Um, a cup full of water, all of those molecules in that cup that's full of water will constantly break and uh, break bonds and reform bonds with maybe an, a neighboring molecule and, and break another bond, form another one. And It's very dynamic and very fluid. And this constant breaking and reforming of hydrogen bonds is characteristic of uh, liquid water. Okay, so when we think about water in itself, water exists in those three state, those three phases of matter, liquid water and gas too, but liquid water specifically, well, you'll see those bonds uh, forming and breaking all the time. And they break um, so quickly that it's about like, um, like a few um, trillionths of a second. You'll have a bond breaking and then reforming again. So it happens very quickly. All right, so going from this idea of hydrogen bonds being really important for maintaining the structure of water. These hydrogen bonds are important because they hold water molecules together. Um, the next question I want to ask you guys is what are properties of water that allow it to function as a support for all living organisms? And that's the next thing that we're going to discuss in um, the next video. I hope that was helpful. So I wanted to leave you with this quote that um, is from my hero, Neil deGrasse Tyson, and he's quoted saying, there are more molecules of water in a cup of water than cups of water in all of the world's oceans. So it's kind of food for thought to think about. Hope you have a good uh, rest of the day and keep studying.